If you're thinking about starting a PhD, it might be good to know a bit more about what life as a PhD student really is like. Here at the Stockholm Resilience Centre, we have several students who have just defended their thesis and after intense preparations have come out on the other side as newly qualified doctors. In this programme, with a bit of cake to celebrate, we sit down with them and talk about their experiences and life that comes after. The transition from doing a master's degree to becoming a PhD student can be a big step. Today we will talk to Megan Meacham, who did both a master's and PhD at the Stockholm Resilience Centre. How did she manage this big change and what advice does she have to those planning on doing the same? Hey, hey. Stille! Hey Megan! Come on in! Thank you! Megan, first of all, congratulations, you're now a doctor. How does that feel? Thanks to that, uh, it feels great, especially just to be done with mm. all the work in the last few months, but overall it feels awesome. Mm. I wanna take you back a little bit and, and start uh, talking to you about the, the big step from doing being a master student and then becoming a PhD student. Uh, how was that? Oh boy, it feels like a lifetime ago. Um, so I did my master's at SRC also uh, from 2007 to 2009. And when I finished my master's, I thought, there is no way I'm going to keep doing research or do a PhD. Why would I inflict this again on myself? The finishing of the master's and writing the master's thesis was tough and I thought okay I achieved that now it's time to move on mm. um, but over the years between the master's and the PhD then I worked in university settings without the pressure mm. of producing a thesis or anything like that working as a research assistant or in projects or doing reports um, and then I got sucked in again mm. and I just thought this is really fun and uh, yeah, I should, I should do a PhD. So you decided to do it eventually mm. after all these, these years in between. Uh, but what happened? Tell us. Well, I was working on a project uh, that I really liked that was also about ecosystem services, which is what my PhD is about. But it was in a very different context. Mm. And then this project came up where there was funding to study ecosystem services in the Nordstrom Basin, which is like a part of Sweden. And I thought, well, that case is less enticing mm. than where I was working, but it's secured money. It's a long-term project. I like the people that are gonna be in it. Let's do it. Mm -hmm. So uh, the topic was similar to what I was working with, but the context was very different. Mm. Um, but yeah, it was, it was a good choice, I think. And how would you say, what would you say is the biggest difference? Obviously, there are, there are obvious differences, but what would you say are the biggest differences from doing a, a master's degree and a thesis there to doing then a full-on PhD degree? Well, the master's and doing the master's thesis is just learning how to do mm -hmm. research. So I think the emphasis there isn't necessarily on the product mm. as a scientific product, but just learning how to produce science. Um, but then switching to a PhD is like, okay, now this is training, practicing being a scientist. Mm. And um, the project that I joined, we were two PhDs that started at the same time, a postdoc and two like lead researchers, which are the supervisors. And that was really nice to start as a team and like a mm -hmm. unit because it was really supportive. And also then the, the first initial goals of the project were kind of laid out. So then I knew what sort of tasks and what the p first paper would be mm -hmm. even. So that was really useful. Um, and yeah, you end up just producing actual science, mm -hmm. not just uh, practice science, as I felt the master's was more of. Mm -hmm. 
And you mentioned already you did your master's and your PhD at the Stockholm Resilience Center. How was that doing both at the same place? It was good for a lot of reasons because you, of course, know a lot of the people there, mm. and I think it's important in a PhD to connect to other researchers, and you get a lot of support from the community, especially at SRC. Mm. Um, but the downside could be that you become quite isolated because you're working with the same people for many years. Mm -hmm. um, but how I countered that was I got involved in a lot of big research networks through like conferences. I was also helping run the Future Earth program uh, on ecosystem change in society. Mm -hmm. And that connected me to a lot of other universities, other programs, and so that kind of counteracted isolation that you might feel if you mm. stay at the same place for mm. a long time. And that, that sort of process or, or rather the road, the journey that you were on as a PhD student, tell us a little bit about that. I mean, did you experience like second thoughts, panic or frustration along the way or indeed the opposite, growing confidence? Well, my journey, so my PhD is kind of in two parts. One is the very detailed uh, data-driven work uh, looking at ecosystem services in Sweden and then the other part was running this big collaborative network of uh, long-term in-depth case studies so my case study contributed to this uh, platform which is the program on ecosystem change in society mm. PEX but I was also uh, helping coordinate PEX as a program and so uh, even from the beginning, the PEX work was the most fun because you got to uh, create workshops and bring everyone together and just share ideas, get, gain insights from everyone's cases. And that's what I found the most fun. So then the, I guided my PhD to focus a lot on that towards the end. So like the fourth paper in my uh, thesis is from, from that community. Mm. Um, but it was nice in the beginning we produced like the first paper quite quickly and that gave me a lot of confidence mm. of like, oh yeah, I can publish something and it works. Mm. And, yeah. What about challenges along the way? Anything particular that you remember? Well, I mean, it's a, not necessarily a bad thing, but especially when you start a PhD, there's so many opportunities and it's mm. hard to know what to say yes to and what to say no to. So in the beginning, I was at lots of conferences, involved in lots of different communities, and that's a really good way of getting to know mm. uh, the broader community and also where you're situated in it and kind of what your position is. But um, yeah, everything has a time cost. So mm. just being better at knowing what's a priority for me, what has a lot of, uh, what, yeah, will give me the most mm. or where I can contribute the most and kind of putting up some boundaries on mm. that. So that was a challenge. And what's the worst thing or what's the best thing about doing a PhD? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so the best thing is the freedom. I mean, you have years to do, I mean, not only whatever you want mm. but you have freedom and you can take courses that you find interesting you can go to conferences that you think are interesting you can collaborate with people you can uh, go to workshops you can um, yeah really spend time just like marinating in your own <laughs> ideas which i think uh, that sort of time is a real luxury and you don't get outside of a phd particularly mm. the worst thing I mean, it's that you need to produce one huge thing in the end. And that requires a lot of time management and a lot of organization. And I felt like I'm a pretty organized person and I was pretty well prepared, but it was still very intense uh, mm. producing the final thesis in the end. Um, and that's maybe I have this feeling because I'm so close to that happening, but that was a challenge and mm. it's like, okay, you have this one thing and you need to plan your four or five years around producing that mm. one thing. But and in between, 
life comes comes in the way so sort of, you know yep. family yep. everything else how i mean i want to touch upon a little bit um you know how you deal with how you dealt with mm. stress and, and all these things that come along yeah any any particular things that you did well i had two kids during the phd and that's both a source of stress and a solution to them <laughs> <laughs> because uh I was, especially before having my first kid, I was kind of halfway-ish through the PhD, and I thought, oh my gosh, I'm going to take a whole year, basically, pause from mm. this, and I'm going to miss all those meetings, all those workshops, all those emails, all those articles that come out. And you just feel like you're jumping off this speeding train, mm. and how are you ever going to catch up? But then, after having a child, refocusing all priorities to focus on this, tiny human being and you like live in the moment and you're not worried about emails or publications or anything like that it was so nice to come back to realize i came back to work and like oh yeah another conference comes around another meeting comes you didn't miss really anything mm -hmm. you can always catch up and um and then it was just really nice to have this break and the adjustment of priorities and to spend time away from my mm. work and come back to it and, and look at it again and go, oh yeah, that was the interesting part. Mm. Like, I'd, when you're in it and you're too close to it, it's hard to see kind of the forest through the trees. Mm. But when you take a break, then you come back and it's a little bit easier. And I guess a way, in a way, we should add, we should say as well, you know, that you, know, you did your PhD here in Sweden. We are yeah. in a somewhat privileged yes. country to do these things, and that allows us to to combine such big parts of our lives. Uh, yeah. It's well. such a luxury to be able to take paid parental leave. Mm. Also knowing that my partner can do that and uh, and that it doesn't affect my work and the PhD just waits for me. That was really nice. And then mm. how I deal with stress in work is it's so nice to come home to kids because you can be really stressed with analysis or writing or something and you come home and then your kids are like, now you have to be a dinosaur <laughs> and you're like crawl around on the floor pretending to be a dinosaur or something and it's just like you can't bring work home mm. with you in mm. that way uh, and, and tell us a little bit of, i mean so the time management mm. of things now you have uh, two children who indeed mm. you know force you to to manage your time more mm. carefully but if i if i can even allow myself to sort of put the ch children away for a bit and how do you actually organize your time as at work and these tight deadlines, the pressure and everything. What did you do to, to mm. properly organize yourself? Well, deadlines are the most useful thing because like I said, the, maybe the hardest part of the PhD is that you're producing one giant thing over a long period of time. Mm. And if you kind of procrastinate or something, it would become impossible. So having strict deadlines was key. Mm. So for papers, for example, several of my papers are in special issues, which in academic journals is when like a specific theme is being highlighted. Mm. So uh, then that journal will set a specific deadline for papers that are going to be contributed to that special issue. So that really push, puts pressure on like, okay, we got to get this paper done and we need to get it submitted. And that was very useful because papers can drag on for really long periods mm. of time and they can always be improved and they can always be readjusted or something. So it was nice to have strict deadlines. And then in the PhD program at SRC, we have strict deadlines set in for finishing it halfway to having 80% seminars to all sorts of deadlines that sort of force you to mm. uh, show where you are Mm. and push you to get things done for those. Mm. And I think that's so useful. Uh, apart from playing a dinosaur with your kids, how did you relax and unwind? Yeah, I mean, mostly by doing nothing. I mean, I would love to say that I like unwind with a good book or <laughs> something, but especially towards the end, when all you do at work is like read, reading articles or reading books, then I just didn't have the energy for that. So mm -hmm. a lot of nothing. Um, I want to talk to you about the actual defense, mm -hmm. your defense and how you prepared for that and yeah, the actual process and everything around it. Let me start off with then the preparations for it. How did you prepare for your defense? 
Well, so there's this lag between when the book is finished and the defense happens. So the book gets finished and printed like a month before mm -hmm. the defense. Um, and finishing the book was the more stressful part for me, getting the writing done and getting the book printed. Um, so then I really needed a break after that. So in, so in this month gap, I kind of said two weeks and I can do anything. And then after two weeks, I'll start thinking about the presentation and the defense and stuff. And we have this really special um, practice within the PhD group to hold like a practice defense. Mm. So the other PhDs read all the parts of your thesis. And then I gave a practice presentation and then they throw all their questions at me. And honestly, the quality of the questions, the number of the questions, and the diversity of the questions were covered everything in the defense plus more. Mm. So I felt really prepared, and that's a huge thanks to the PhD group mm. by proposing all these questions to me. Mm. And then came the day. Yep. The big day. Um, how was that? You are usually you look you come across as extremely cool and calm and collected, maybe. Yeah. But Still nervous? Yeah, I usually don't get nervous when it comes to like presentations or anything like that. But I was actually nervous during this presentation, which is a weird feeling for me. I even thought while I was talking, like, this is weird, I'm feeling nervous. <laughs> but then as soon as the discussion started with the discussant or opponent and the committee, then it was just fun. Mm. I mean, you never get to sit and talk about your own work for extended periods of time with people that have read it. Mm. It's so nice. I mean, that was actually really fun. So what, I mean, what kind of advice would you then give to someone who is now preparing for their defense? For their defense? Well, I got the same advice that I would give but didn't trust it. It's that you know your stuff. Mm. Like, if you've produced a thesis and worked this many years on your stuff. There's no one that knows it more than you. So in that way you can relax, like you know it. But I got that advice and I still didn't trust it um, completely mm -hmm. until I started getting the questions. And then I was like, of course I know all these things. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I think uh, the system in Sweden of finishing the book ahead of the defense is really what prepares you mm -hmm. for the defense. So. Um, focus on finishing the book and then you'll be fine. Mm. But also, I mean, right now is a totally different setup than we've had previously mm. because of the coronavirus. Mm. So setting up the technology and camera angles and testing the webinar and all that stuff, it took way more time than I imagined. Uh, and I had an amazing team. I basically had two full tech people online the whole time or running the whole show and a chair and everything worked great, but mm. it still took a lot more time than I thought it was. So mm. just if for some reason defenses have this technical element that we've now had to have mm. to know that it takes more time than you think mm. to set it all up. Um, I want to talk to you about your, your the, the people around you, and mm. especially the supervisors. Yeah. Um, how would you describe your relationship with your supervisors? Well, I've had two supervisors. So Albert Nordstrom's my main supervisor and then Gary Peterson is the co-supervisor. But they were really a team and we worked very closely together. Albert was also the director of the Future Earth program that I worked for. So we worked really closely um, in coordinating that program also. Um, so they're very different people, and I feel like taking on a PhD student is a big leap of faith mm. because you need a lot of trust in your student and you're committing to working with someone for years. It's one of the longest commitments that you have in academia because mm. afterwards postdocs are only one year or two years or something. Um, so, But I felt that trust from the beginning, and I always felt like... Um, I was respected, my input was uh, respected and wanted, and I was, I was included in everything, in workshops and meetings and stuff where n it wasn't necessarily um, 
a place where other PhD students were included, but mm. I was always brought, and I felt uh, that was a privilege, and I really appreciated that. Mm. So we worked really closely together, and we had, I wouldn't say a very structured, like we didn't meet every week on a certain time, but like very open door mm. as things come up, and worked closer at certain periods around finalizing papers or something, but yeah, it worked really well. And I think it was just about having open communication and mm. trust mm. in each other. We spoke to Albert oh about boy. you <laughs> and about your research and everything. And uh, so let's see what he said. All right. Okay, Albert, uh, good to see you. Good to see and, you too, uh, Stuart. Thanks for, for taking time to, to talk to us about Megan's work. Now, she just graduated and uh, is another one of our doctors, and you've been her supervisor. Um, let me start off with uh, the fact that she just graduated and tell us how do you think her defense went? Thanks, Dylan. Now, well, it wasn't a big surprise for me and for us that I've been working with Megan, but she, she completely rocked it. She's done an extremely good job. Um, she's She's always so calm and, and collected, um, and that really shone through um, in, in the defense. I think her capacity to just sit down and in a very honest way, answer the quite you know, tricky questions, which is part and parcel of, of defending your PhD. Hmm. And never trying to kind of um, hide away some of the weaknesses of, of the work. They're, they're always weaknesses. Hmm. I think she she was very um, and that that impressed the uh, the opponents and their committee that she was very aware of the weaknesses and of the strengths of the work, never tried to hide it and answered everything in an extremely calm, um, professional um, and uh, completely satisfactory way. So she uh, it was extremely impressive. You you I think you you mentioned a little bit already, you know. How would you describe Megan as a person? Cool, calm, and collected. No, very stressed. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't think it's a secret um, that Megan is one of the calmest, most chilled uh, people um, that we've ever had the uh, the, uh, the the happiness to work with. Mm. Um, she's also extremely sharp, um, very quick to uh, to learn new concepts. But and never afraid to ask, you know, that, that when she doesn't understand things or when she needs help, she mm -hmm. she absolutely comes. She's not a person that's going to lock herself in a room and then six months later appear and say, well, I never understood the statistical analysis. Um, how does it happen? She She's honest, um, but but never stressed, um, always common click. And that, that kind of helps as well in the kind of role that she's had. Um, she's had a very strong research role, but also um, a kind of convening role because of her participation in these big programs and big networks um, like the Future Earth program on ecosystem change in society, where she's had to deal with, you know, big names in science from the beginning. Has She's never been flustered. Um, she's always been able to meet them eye to eye, face to face in a very respectful manner, but, but without ever kind of breaking a nerve. How would you describe the relationship between you as a supervisor and, uh, and, and the, the student? Um, personally, I, I'm in favor of having a, a close relationship with PhD students, having an open door policy, at least in the initial first couple of years where you know that you're gonna have to spend a bit more time in, um, in showing the ropes, um, in engaging with you know, design of, of research, um, writing papers, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and these things usually, as time goes by, the PhD student captures more autonomy and mm -hmm. just becomes much more independent. Um, but then, of course, you have to remember that as a PhD supervisor, you, you are a mentor. You, it's good to be good friends, but that's not your only role, right? You have to teach, you have to navigate, you have to be a mentor of sorts to make sure that the, uh, the education, because that's what it is, actually turns out for the benefit of the PhD student. Mm -hmm. And... You obviously succeeded uh, in, in supervising Megan. She's now graduated. Uh, what kind of advice would you give her on her way forward? You know, my advice to Megan would be try and take some stock and uh, gauge what are the things I enjoyed the most during these five, six years, and then try and visualize career scenarios, which at least magnify most of these things, because that's, that's really 
when things become most fun is when you're actually doing at least most of the things you enjoy doing. So that was Albert advising you to take, you know, take a breather and take stock of things. Mm. Is that what you're planning to do or have you already lined up your next few years at least a <laughs> career? Definitely not. Well, now I'm actually going to teach a course on the ecosystem service assessments, uh, which will hopefully be a bit more practical and help people do th that themselves. Mm. But that's a pretty short term uh, course. And then I'm going to take a break. Uh, I need it. I don't know what I want to do. And um, yeah, I just need some time to mm. figure it out. And final question, Megan, to mm. you, now that you are a doctor, you, know, you can give all the advice to the world about mm -hmm. what to do, not to do. What advice would you give to someone who is considering doing a PhD? Don't do it. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, I think it's obviously a very worthwhile thing to do, but think about what do you want to do afterwards? And is this the best path to get there? Mm. Because I think I mean, I spent, well, in my case, with kids and everything, many years doing my PhD, and that kind of work experience or that many years of work experience will also get you very far. Mm. So thinking about what you want to do afterwards and why you want to do a PhD is important. And also just take advantage of the freedom you get doing a PhD mm. and meet as many people as you can, go to lots of conferences, make your PhD group a uh, fun, uh, useful cohort and yeah, just enjoy the time. Enjoy the time. That mm. sounds like an excellent advice. <laughs> Thank you so much, Megan. And whatever you do, mm. good luck. Thanks. So some sound advice there from Megan. There are many reasons why people do a PhD. And if you are planning on doing one, Take some time off to think about why you want to do it and what you want out of it. Then it'll be easier to enjoy the many benefits such a degree has to offer.